in the concept around the world. John studied international relations and urban design. He's worked as a journalist in TV and film. He's been chairman and director of several media and entertainment companies, including one of the first streaming companies. He's therefore uniquely qualified to talk about the world of work, and it's a great pleasure to talk to him. We'll have discussion around themes in the book, and there'll be time for questions, so please put them in the chat. This is the second time we're doing uh, one of these webinar conversations, so please give us feedback. So to kick off, thanks very much, John, for taking the time to speak to us. Tell us a little bit about the new book, Invisible Work. Thank you very much, John. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Nesta, for inviting me to talk about it. The book, the, the new book, Invisible Work, really grows in a way out of the work that I did after the last book, which was 20 years ago. And since then, I have met a lot of people that um, are creative in one way or another uh, and innovative because the two things sort of merge into each other. And I, I, was, I was interested in who they were and how they worked. And I realized that they had a mindset that was sort of different from other people. And I couldn't quite pin it down. And they seem to approach their work differently. They seem to work, they seem to approach and collaborate with other people differently. They approach their jobs differently, they approach management differently. Everything seems to be different. And I, I couldn't quite pin it down. And then one day I was looking around the office of a company, uh, a tech startup, a streaming, one of the first streaming video streaming companies in, in the UK. And there were about 20 people there and I knew them very well. I knew them personally very well and I knew what they were doing roughly. You know, I knew the projects we had and I knew what everybody was doing, what their contribution to the project was. And I looked around the room and I realized that I couldn't at that moment tell who was actually working or mm -hmm. not. And I mean, that in a way that didn't matter because they were working, I, you know, most of the time and, and working well. Um, but I also realized that if any of them was having a problem or wanted a break or wanted to talk to somebody else or wanted to get a bit of advice or support or something, that I, or indeed anybody else, couldn't tell because it was invisible. Mm -hmm. And of course we know that you know, when we're thinking, all our thoughts are, are, are invisible. But we, we sort of we, we sort of treat that as a sort of rather incidental matter. But I realized it was actually quite important to how we as a company were operating and how each individual was operating. And then about a year later, when I began to think about this in sort of slightly more seriously, began to think about writing a book about it, I was speaking at a conference on work organized by the AHRC and the Royal College of Art. There were about 200 people in the room, all of whom were experts on work. And, and quite I didn't plan this, this was quite spontaneous. I asked, and it was a Friday morning, mid-morning, about 11 o'clock. I said, okay, uh, here we are. Um, how many people in this room are working as of this moment, right now? And about a third put their hands up and said, yes. Third put their hands up and said, no. And a third put their hands up and said, well, actually, I don't know. And I thought, well, I'm with them, actually, because, you know, it's actually quite hard. To, I mean, I'm working because I'm speaking, but you're sitting in the audience, you're working. And these are the experts on work. Um, uh, at a conference on work, and they don't know whether they're working or not. So I thought, OK, on one hand, work is incredibly important in our lives. Um, it's one of the most important things in our lives for most of us. But no one quite knows whether they're doing it or not. And so obviously some people know whether they're doing it or not. If they're doing manual work, physical work, or they've got to be in a particular place at a particular time as part of their work, then they're working. But the rest of us? So I began to think about this and I began to think there's, there's, there's a kind of work that, that, that is going on which is invisible so we don't really notice it and we don't pay a lot of attention to it. It's the work in our heads. It's cognitive work. It's, it's always got a fairly strong emotional dimension or emotional heft. It's subjective. It's subjective work. 
it's very personal. In fact, it starts in really deep privacy. And it remains always personal. And there are two other things going on. One is nomadic. We can sort, we can do a lot of it almost anywhere. And also it's never ending. It's, it's, it's ideas once someone has them and thinks about them, they stick in the mind. Even if we put them out, we voice them, we communicate them. Um, they move into some sort of public domain. Anybody can pick them up um, and run with them. Some people are annoyed by that and they think, well, that was my idea. But you know, the reality is we all borrow, steal, beg, use ideas from anywhere, and that's fine as far as I'm concerned. So there was a there's a kind of work that was going on that I originally called fuzzy work, I now call it invisible work, that has these characteristics. And I realized that it was the work that was personally most interesting to the individual, usually that it was the work that was most valuable to the organization, it was the work that was creative, that led to innovation, that made a difference, that moved things along a little way. It was the kind of work that graduates like to do. Um, and it's the work that is often more, more highly paid, not always highly paid, but you, you won't, you won't get a high salary unless you do it. And I was very struck by a remark by um, the founder of Spotify, who said, nothing, nothing happens here really without a bit of an invisible work along the way. So that was the origin of the book. And that was what I'm, what I'm um, talking about. Uh, uh, just two other things that I was saying all that came to mind that are in the book. One is that I make a big difference between work and a job. And that difference is widening. Uh, and that has a lot of implications for how, how we talk about work and how we talk about jobs. And the other is that I see work as a human endeavor. Um, it, it's, 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 not a, it's, it's not only an economic matter, it's not only a business matter, it's a human endeavor. Um, and actually a third thing I'll mention if I can. One is that that we, we, we are increasingly, we, we have to take charge of our work. If you're doing visible work, it's up to you. You've got to take charge of it. And I came across a fantastic statistic that is sort of, it's a factoid, it's sort of irrelevant, but I think it's very revealing. In the first quarter of 2017, there were more companies set up in London than babies born. Now, no, I'm not making a comparison between papers and companies. That's why it's a factor. But, but it's a sort of, it's a sort of remarkable fact. More companies set up than babies born. So that is what um, that's that's invisible work. Ah, th thank you. And I guess one of the things that may be driving this tend toward work being invisible is the degree to which, because of things like laptops and digital tools, we can work much more flexibly. We don't need to be in the office. We can work from home. We can choose when we work. And one of the themes in your book is the, the extent to which there's a greater focus on perhaps the individual in shaping their, their career and taking charge. And I was wondering if you see the positives and negative sides of that in a way, and I guess that perhaps there's greater freedom, but maybe more uncertainty operating in this individual. And what, what, what your reflections on that, that were? There is, there is more emphasis on, I mean, it is the individual that does the individual, the work, it, it does, does the work. Um, and so the individual has to be a little bit more assertive and, as I say, take charge of their thoughts and make sure that they individually make a contribution. However, um, in almost everything we do now, we need other people at almost every stage of the process. And so it's not only the ability to manage one's own thoughts internally, if you like, but the ability to find other people that you can work with, articulate your thoughts to, push the thought ahead to the next stage. And, and this is where cooperation, co-creation, collaboration, teamwork all come in. And it's, it's, it's hard to find someone who is 
successful in developing their thoughts, either in a um, personal way or in a business way, without having a fairly high, strong ability to articulate and work with other people. So yes, we need to be strong individuals. That's, that's not easy. And also we need to put ourselves somewhere where we are working with other people who are, we're helping them and they're helping us. Mm -hmm. And I guess in some cases you could see the model for success, visible success in certain areas. So for example, the creative industries is often quite individualistic. The idea of the lone artist, there's a bit in your, your book where you ask, someone asks you, should they become a film director or not? And maybe you're, you slightly manage their expectations about how realistic that, that is. What, what, did you, what do you think about that? Do you think we should have broader models uh, of success that people should, should be inspired by? Yes, I, because I, I work mainly in, in television and, and film, film production, a bit of film distribution. Um, a lot of people come to me and say, I, I really want to work in the film industry. And they almost always mean they want to be a director. And, and yet the number of directors, the proportion of people in the industry that are actually directors is minuscule. I mean, it's, under, it's way under 1%. And so, I mean, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit harsh on this, I have to say. I mean, if, if I say, how many films have you made so far? You know. Because if, if you want to be a film director, if you want to be an architect, if you want to be a designer, um, if you want to play around with code, you, you can't stop doing it. Mm -hmm. You just do it, you know. And now one can make films on iPhones. And, and in fact, I, I'm involved with a company that is called First Person Films. And, and it started when someone made really successful films that got audiences and BAFTA awards on her iPhone. So if someone comes to me and says, I want to be a director, oh, I haven't actually made any films yet, but I really want to learn how, I forget it. And mm. so the, the number of, if you like, um, obviously creative people, writers, directors, actors aren't really creative. I mean, act, the writers, directors, and then some of the crew um, will be truly and wonderfully creative. Most people are you know, occasionally creative, they just do their work very well and they see how they can do it better and fit the film and so on and so forth. And those people are critical to a film and have often been ignored by the people that want to work in the film business. So I'm, I, I, I'm saying, yes, yes, you know, you can be a strong-minded individual, but you can also get a lot of really good work in the creative industries without being the sort of top of the bill director or top of the bill novelist. Yeah. And you highlight the importance of, of working with others. And one of the things that comes out of the book is perhaps there's a tension between, say, formal structures and the need to be innovative and creative. And you talk about some of the ways that different companies, so you give the example of Spotify and Morningstar, have come up with kind of innovative uh, team structures to help uh, stimulate innovation and creativity. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, I, I, um, I'm a great fan of, of um, Drucker, the, the management um, expert and writer. And he said, there are three levels of management. First of all, you have to manage yourself. If you don't do that, the rest doesn't work. Then you manage for the organization. And thirdly, you do so for the good of society. And Morningstar and Spotify use what I call swarms. They don't use this term, but I use the word swarms. Um, and it, it starts by managing yourself. And then it, it talks about managing your relationship with your colleagues. And in fact, Morningstar has what's called a colleague letter of understanding that you sign with 10 colleagues at the start of the year. And it, List what you're interested in, what you're good at, what you're going to do, and, and the other co the, the other ten colleagues have to sign off on it. So, articulating what you're good at and getting buy-in from the people you're going to be working with day to day is is really important. 
Um, so it's taking charge of yourself, but it's also taking charge of your relationships, if you like, with the people that in almost every sector you need in order to do what it is that you want to do. And they sort of need you as well to do whatever it is that, that they want to do. So it's, it's, it's managing yourself, managing that relationship. And I, I do talk about management in the book Invisible Work quite a lot. And I'm very keen to say at the beginning that I'm not talking about people who have like the word manager in the title, their job title, because um, that's becoming, I think, less and less important. It's people who step up at moments when their particular expertise, their knowledge, their, their, their ability to make a contribution is needed, and then stepping back. And this happens in a swarm. Someone can say or think, okay, I can move this ahead to the next stage. They step up, they become a manager, they become a leader. Once they've done what they have the opportunity to do, then they step back again. And I picked up a bit of this from Google, Laszlo Bock, who ran Google's people, he had a fancy title like everybody in Google, it was sort of um, people management. He directed people management for about 10 years. And he said there were the, one of the four criteria he had for hiring people was um, the ability to step up and then the humility to step down again. And this is a much quicker and more productive way of working than having one manager and a group of people who are not managing and sort of waiting for the manager to tell them what to do. I mean, that, that, that really doesn't work. The, the management role, the leadership role, uh, it's, it's the verb I'm stressing, not the noun. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that there are roles that people should take on at different times of the day. And I guess at the moment we're living through quite difficult times when sadly the pattern of work is quite disrupted. Some people aren't able to work, others are having to work from home. And I guess we're having to work in different ways. Do you think that's leading to, to permanent change in the way that we work when we hopefully get through this? I think the COVID crisis is is having a very profound effect on almost everything. And it's having a, a greater effect than on, on, on most sectors on, on the kind of work I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's, it's demand, demand for the creative industries, goods, services, experiences, whatever. Um, has fallen off a cliff. Mm -hmm. The the fashion, you American fa the demand for American fashion was down uh, eighty five percent in in March. Um, I read today from Enders Analysis that the the journalism in the UK and their particular concern with journalism throughout the whole country, including local journalism, um, they're going to lose one billion pound sterling off the top line. Um, so any activity that needs um, group work, teamwork, travel, and gatherings is in a really, really bad way. Plus, so the demand is demand is um, is is falling off a cliff. Supply is falling off a cliff. Um, there's le people are going to have just less money around. There's going to be large amounts of poverty. And also, the, num the very, very large numbers of people in the creative industries work on their own or with one or two other people. And they don't make a lot of money. They don't have any reserves. Maybe they have no savings. And they're going to maybe be able to complete the work that they're doing. Maybe, maybe not. Actually, in many cases, not. They're going to find it very hard to get new work. And so 
and companies are not hiring. And, and, and when, when companies are talking about going back to work, they're not going to hire new people. Um, they're not going to be taking on many interns because there's no point having an intern who stays at home, works from home. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't work. The point about being an intern is you, you get to know people and you, you mm -hmm. observe them working. So, so I think the creative industries are, 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 are going to be suffering very substantially. And, and government is doing actually quite a lot. And the President's Federation is, is taking some good steps. Um, but the government has got a problem in working out who actually who is self-employed in this country and which of those people who are self-employed actually um, need help. So mm -hmm. no, I think there's a there's a lot of problems there. I think one one good thing from my um, point of view is that is that everybody who is sitting at home is going through a crash course in in what they mean by work. Uh, what, why, why do I get up in the morning? You know, what, why do I get up? What do I do all day long? Um, what do I want to do all day long? What does my partner or whatever you know, think I do all day long? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do they understand it? Do I understand it? Do my colleagues sure. understand it? All that sort of stuff. So, so there's, a, there's a crash course in the future of work yeah. that we're in the middle of now. Although not, not always an entirely pleasant crash course. No, 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 tough. Uh, it, it's yeah. tough. It's tough. It's tough. I mean, when when eventually we do return to to working in offices, as hopefully will happen, um, do you think? Do you think? Well, do, I guess one question is, do you think that will happen? And I guess another question, and it's a theme that comes up in the book, is there's a project you work on, which is the design of a of a building for the BBC. Do we actually know how to design buildings to to, to make sure that the people who work in them are, are creative and innovative and happy. Because uh, I, I guess in the sense that if we didn't return to the office, that might suggest that perhaps there wasn't, the original building designs weren't quite, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting issue that. I think when, when we can go back to the office, I think some of us can't wait actually to get back to the office and we need to be in the office. Um, some of the advertising agencies, for instance, where they handle very, very large data files, the, the, the people simply can't work at home. They haven't got the connectivity. Um, I'm in Norfolk. I'm not handling big data files. I don't have good connectivity up mm -hmm. here. Um, the government's approach to broadband is, is, um, is embarrassing and awful. Um, so some people will go back to work in offices but I don't think there's going to be a rush for a lot of us. And the people I've talked to say, well, actually, I'm working quite well at home. I think I might continue to do that, certainly for one day a week or two days a week or three days. Um, the trend anyway in London and other big cities is for offices to shrink and become more flexible. The ratio now for uh, between the number of employees in the organization and the number of workspaces is about two to three in other words for um sorry three to two in other words you have you have more people than you have workspaces when i went took my computer to the apple store in norwich a few months ago in february i was talking to the guy that was helping me there and and he was after talking to me he was going to have his six months assessment and so I said, oh, you have lots of, you know, offices, I imagine, behind the showroom. Oh, no, 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 we always have them in cafes. This is Apple, which is, you know, it's got more cash sitting in the back, any other corporation in the world. It, it just, why do we have to pay for an office? Let's use a local cafe. Mm -hmm. well, the weather's nice, they can sit in Chapelfield Park. So offices are getting smaller, more flexible, Nobody became rich by running an office well. Nobody became chief executive by doing property management. We, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. It's not, it's not a core skill. And organizations are focusing on what they can do really well and subcontracting everything else, including office management. So there's a trend to go and hire a, a co-working space, even if you're not interested in co-working. 
mm -hmm. because you've got flexibility on the amount of space you occupy and flexibility on rental terms. So I think the, the future of the office, if you like, is sort of no office. I mean, mm -hmm. it, th there's a statement by Jess Barclay, who has an office full of 7,000 people, theoretically. And he said, never again. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the end of that. So I, 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 did, I, did, I had some fascinating um, weeks writing the book. I analyzed the data of transport for London, the MTA in New York and the bars in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I mapped over the last three decades changes in the way people move around the city. And those urban authorities have a lot of data, not just on their own systems, but how pedestrians and bicycles and so on and so forth. You, and then you add, you add Google data on top of that and Apple data on top of that, and you get a really good sense for how people move around the city. And what's happening is that it's hard to get an exact figure, but like 10, 15% of people go to an office in the morning, stay there all day, and do a reverse commute in the evenings. Tiny, tiny numbers. Everybody else goes somewhere, goes to a cafe, goes to a club, goes to a bar, goes to another cafe, meets someone in another office, goes to their own office, goes out for lunch, has another. So the, the, the office as the place where we do work and the, the, the identification of work and office and office and work is, is getting much weaker. And we now tend to use the whole of our, not the whole of our city, but the whole of our neighborhood as our office. And we therefore worry much less about what the office looks like. And many companies are now turning away from traditional office designers towards designers whose experience lies in domestic residential areas or clubs or hotels or restaurants and bars and cafes because in a way the office in 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 um, in london but it's the same in other cities is becoming a sort of mothership the office is becoming a mothership um, it's becoming a base camp that you need, that you go to, it's there, you, you meet your colleagues there, there'll always be a few people there sort of manning it. Mm -hmm. But the, the more senior, the more experienced you are in the organization, the, the less time you'll spend there. And that's a re really revealing fact. I, 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 was, I mapped quite a few companies and the, the senior people spend less, less, less time in the office. So the future of the office, if you like, is 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 no uh, is no office in the I mean, it's not, the, the the office is no longer the default place mm -hmm. for work. Yeah. One of the things. Thing, well, so it's like okay. One of the things that follows from that is that the kind of work comes out of the office and starts to affect the character of. Places, and I think you can see that in, say, for example, East London and the creative industries, how that's affect the, 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 the kind of the, the broader, broader urban space. I mean, I know you've worked on master planning in China, and I was wondering whether you had any insights from there as to how how you can think about work in the built environment and how it affects affects things. Yes, um, it. Clustering is, and Nest has done a huge amount of work. I mean, Nesta sort of is the kingpin when it comes to thinking about clustering. Cl clustering is a hugely effective, hugely efficient way of, of, of increasing the, the speed and the efficiency and the quality of the work that's done. It, it depends, I think, on two things. It depends on the cluster containing companies, individuals, at every stage of the supply chain. And also on most of the people in this sector working on a freelance basis or self-employed basis. If those two things are true, then the cluster will be hugely efficient. Um, and 
of course, that requires not only for there to be lots of traditional offices, but lots of the what I call third spaces, which are mm -hmm. which are sort of they're not home, they're not office. There's something in between the two, and we all have our favorite third space. In, in fact, most people have more than one favorite third spaces. Um, so you need lots of third spaces, and it 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 depends on those two things. I was very struck uh, when. Channel 4 moved, when, it's, when it opened up, 1992, um, in Fitzrovia, Charlotte Street, it, it stimulated a huge outgrowth of um, independent production companies, the, the, the Indies. It, Channel 4 led to the almost the invention of the Indies, I mean, um, the, the, the gold rush of the Indies. And they were all clustering around the Channel 4 offices in, in Charlotte Street. When, when Channel 4 moved from Charlotte Street to Horse Ferry Road, there was absolutely no similar effect. It did, not, it did not carry on. And I think it's a fascinating example of when clustering works and when it sort of doesn't work. And what happened by the time Channel 4 moved to Horse Ferry Road, the, the industry structure had changed mm -hmm. and the supply chains had changed and we had we had, we were seeing what we used then to call super indies mm -hmm. which were actually very big companies um, so the, the 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 conditions for an effective cluster didn't any longer operate and i think when we think about where to extend this example um, when we think about where the bbc should be and where channel 4 should be and all that sort of stuff um, which is a big government concern. Um, we have to think about: Are we? Are we? Is it actually going to be possible to replicate that generation of a cluster? Uh, is the industry structure still the right kind of industry structure to make a cluster actually take off? You talked about analysing data and one of the things you bring out in the book is the growing importance of AI and new developments like generative adversarial networks that perhaps uh, are more more creative than we've seen in the past and do you think that AI is starting to become creative and how do you think this might start to to affect uh, what creative companies do? I think AI in some very limited fields is already being what I call creative. It, it's a lot of American newspapers use AI on a routine basis for sports results, uh, sports uh, news, not just the results, but the story around the results. Um, they use it for police for police um, reports and, and, and so on and so forth, because the AI can generate um, emotional language. AI does not feel emotion, but it can generate emotional language. Um, I think it's very interesting when AlphaGo played Lisa Doll, the world Go champion, and there was a move. Always, I, I've been fascinated by this move. It, it, second game, the five game, second game, move thirty seven, when AlphaGo, which couldn't actually move a pebble, but it, it it asked its human helper to move the pebble to a part of the board that was unexpected. And the move took everybody by surprise. It took the deep mind people that programmed AlphaGo, it took them by surprise, it took the Google people by surprise, and it took all the Go experts by surprise. And the next morning's press conference, Demis Azabias, who founded uh, DeepMind, was asked about this. And he said, well, actually, yes, amazing, isn't he? He said, he said um, Alpha, we, we've, we've written algorithms that, that are, we've created a machine that is aggressive and um, intuitive. Now, frankly, I don't think he has. I, mean, I think there's some misuse of language, but I, I appreciate that, it, that we don't have the language to describe the result of those sorts of algorithms. And we cannot ask the AI why AI has no ability to explain. Uh, I think it's a very important factor that. 
even the people that program it mm. um, cannot ask it to explain why did you do that they, they can't do it so we fall back on human language which i think is which i think is wrong um but i so i think ai can be what i would call creative they can do something very different and rather uh, rather inventive and and, and and in that case successful and maybe rather beautiful and astonishing and so on. So what AI doesn't have is any, it doesn't have agency. Mm -hmm. So it could it could produce a calculation that that was remarkable, but it it, it can't do more than that. It, it doesn't have any determination to take that to the next step. It doesn't have any ability to imagine that maybe it should start writing a book on this <laughs> or, or invent a brand or invent an app. It, 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 it has no, it has no mm -hmm. agency. It has no determination, no passion. It cannot talk to people to work out how to take this to the next step. It simply produces, um, it simply produces a result. It's not persuasive. Mm -hmm. There's a remark, isn't it, which I'm going to now change, but it's something like um, genius is one, the genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Well, I think genius is about 1% inspiration and 99% persuading other people that your idea is really worth their attention. Mm -hmm. And AI has no ability to persuade, it mm -hmm. just produces results. So, there's, there's, there's some way to go. I think what AI is capable of is, or could and probably will be capable of, is hugely important, but it doesn't yet have that agency. Mm -hmm. There's actually the, the critical skill, that ability to articulate and persuade. And one of the, the leading research centers for AI globally is China, and I'm conscious you've worked a lot in China. Uh, and therefore, it'd be good to get your, your perspective on how we might misperceive China in, in the West uh, and what, what you think the mis misconceptions are. How long do we have? <laughs> I think... Uh, a few minutes, a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, two, two, great, I mean, two great cultures, uh, societies, ways of thinking, China and to some extent other, other societies in Asia. And then the the west um including the, U, the uk europe and um and america and i think they are fundamentally different fundamentally different i think there was a time politically when there could have been a coming together if you like 1990s 2010 it's now getting worse um politically it's getting much getting much much worse um I, I, I would say, however, that when I talk to a architect or a designer, because I get involved in, as you said, in, in master plans, um, and also a bit in software, when I, and, and visual art as well. And when I talk to people in China, the creative people, the creative businesses, the architects, the designers in China, I have the same sort of conversation as I would have if I was talking to someone in London or LA, or it's, a, it's the same sort of individual um, trying to do something interesting, beautiful, elegant, quicker, whatever it is. The, 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 men, the, the mental, cognitive, psychological processes are, are remarkably similar. Where they differ is in their approach to um free speech that's actually not that's important but it's not the most important i think the most important thing is they differ in their attitude towards social responsibility and in china and in most asian countries in china the creative person the creative organization thinks much earlier on in the process about the social impact of what they're doing whereas in the west we, we give the artist, the designer, the creative person, uh, the theater director, um, complete freedom mm -hmm. to do whatever it is they want to do. And that's great. And we like that. And we don't want to give that up. That's very important to us as a civilization and culture. 
And if, if it works, it works, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's Mark in the sun. Um, so I have one final question, then we'll go to, to take some of the questions that have been coming in while we've been speaking. And I guess it's a question about UK, you spoke about the difficulties that the current COVID situation is creating. I think before the current circumstances, you had a situation where creative industries were going very rapidly, uh, also in the context of growing global demand yeah. around the world and greater development, but I guess also more yeah. competition yeah. in the creative industries yeah. as well. And I just wondered what your reflections might be in terms of the future and where, how optimistic you, you feel at the moment, particularly given the current uh, difficult circumstances. I think we're in for a very rough ride in the short term. And I think we're all slowly becoming aware that the short term is rather longer than we had originally anticipated. I think we're, I think we're for a very rough ride. Um, it'll, it'll be different sector by sector, but I think we're in for a very rough ride in the short term. Long term, there's no question that a lot of the, the, a lot of the individuals, the companies, the, um, the things they produce, the goods, the products, the services, the experiences, um, fulfill such a basic need that they will, they will come back. Of course they will. I think the big growth of, of um, local, localism, I think a tremendous increase in localism, which is, I, I think, really important. Um, I think there's going to be two huge opportunities have come up, um, which we haven't really talked about much. Uh, I don't mean today, but over the last few years. One is um, healthcare, and the other is education, which have sort of resisted creativity and innovation. I, they, they have, they're huge. Two of the three most biggest sectors in the world after the military spending. So huge, very, very important. Education in particular has, has resisted um, rethinking how it does its work. And I think that's a, uh, that's a, that's a problem. And I think there's an opportunity there. Um, I'm very concerned about what I call Generation C, it's Generation COVID. It's, it's everybody who is coming to the end of their school days, um, GCSE, A-levels, um, maybe wanting to go to university come, or maybe at university taking finals. Um, people who are looking for their first job, people who are got a job but it's not a good job, looking for their first good job, um, so it's quite a it's quite a large number. It's not just this year; it's quite a large number. Of and they are their lives have been interrupted already, and those interruptions and and problems could continue. And I I think it's it's a cohort of people that don't have a voice and they don't have a representative and. I'm very worried about them. And I, I'm worried about Generation C and I don't want them to become a sort of forgotten generation. Mm -hmm. They're hugely important. And we've got to do something to make sure that they are helped over these very difficult um, periods at the moment. And um, I think that's a priority for, for the government and, and for the rest of us to do what we can on that, just on generation C. Yeah. It's an important note on, on which to end and thank you very much for, for all the insights. We've had some questions that have been coming in while we've been speaking. We may have to go quite quickly to try and get 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 through, through them, but but starting at the top, we have one that uh, it's almost a grammatical question. It, it is, is work a noun or a verb? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Oh gosh, it's a it's a it's a ver I it's a verb. It's a process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it is a noun as well, but it's, it's a very good question. That um, I do say in the book somewhere that job a job is a position, and work is a process. And if I was asked to choose between noun and verb, I would go for for verb. Mm -hmm. I think work is a process, and that puts challenges in terms of. Um, how do you manage it? How do you reward it? Uh, how do you get paid for it? All that sort of stuff. 
So no, I think I, I like that. No, I, I, I'll plump for, for verb. I hope that's the right answer. I don't know. And we, we have a question next that is, uh, I think answered in some detail in the book, but it's what's the difference between innovation and creativity as traits? Ah, yes. Um, I, I see creativity as leading to, in lots of different directions, and sometimes it leads to innovation. It can lead to innovation. Sometimes it leads nowhere. Um, sometimes it leads to something which we would call art, and sometimes it leads to something called science, something can lead to innovation. Um, uh, creativity is, to me, unique and unrepeatable. Whereas the point of innovation is that I produce something that I can then hand over to you and you can copy precisely. It's completely repeatable, endlessly repeatable. Um, there's a lovely quote that I shall quickly say. Lawrence Olivier, one of the greatest actors of the last century, once gave a fantastic performance um, of Hamlet and his friends went round afterwards to the dressing room and to congratulate him. And they found him crying, he was sobbing. And one of them said, why? What, what, your, the performance was fantastic. And Olivia said, yes, I, I know, but I don't know why. And he knew he couldn't do it again <laughs> the next day. He was being creative on stage in a sense, making it up as he went along, reacting to the actors and the script, the text, the director. And he knew he couldn't replicate it. That was creativity. If he'd been able to solidify it in a blueprint and write it down, and then everybody, if he could do it the next day and everybody else could do it the next day, that would be innovation. Mm -hmm. And I guess you raised one of the challenges of that particular characteristics in that how, you, how you teach it which links nicely to the next question, which is what is the future of staff learning uh, and development, perhaps? What, what, what's the room uh, for, for the future in, in that area, if, if creativity is so important? For, for staff learning, for employees yeah. learning. Yeah. Well, I think I talk in the book about what I call the capacity to learn, mm -hmm. which is a fundamental uh, faculty, if you like. It, the phrase comes from an Indonesian man called Sitchika Moka, a uh, very remarkable man. And it's the capacity to learn, and individuals um, have it to greater or lesser degree. And in fact, I believe that any social organization can have it. So you can talk about a team having it, a company having it. You can even talk about a city having it, actually, um, or a government having it. Um, so, 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 so the 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 um, the capacity to learn, and I think, in my own experience. I have learned most of what I know through working with other people in companies mm -hmm. uh, in that very intensive learning environment um, where we work together. We don't mind admitting we don't know stuff. We don't mind being vulnerable to others. We don't mind asking for help. They don't mind asking us for help. And I think that should be a continual process that is that is built into the package of of work. Uh, I, I I don't like away days. I think any company that goes on an away day is sort of saying help. You know, <laughs> we, um, well, everything happens in an away day should be part of the normal work process. Mm -hmm. And again, this is why clustering helps because. You can go out and walk down the road and have a cup of coffee with someone who works in a different company, mm -hmm. um, but in the same sort of business, but in a different part of it. And you're endlessly picking up little tips, ideas, perspectives. And you need to be in, you need to have the mindset yourself to be in a company or to live in a neighborhood where that is the prevalent mindset. Mm -hmm. Which coincidentally links very nicely to the next question, which is. Uh, from, from the, it's, I love the term third space. How can a company embrace this concept to enhance creativity and product? Well, I think it's up to the individual. I think once companies get their sticky fingers on it, it, it tends to look a little bit too much like 
a corporate endeavor. I'm associated with a company that recently moved from Clerkenwell. About I, 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 15 people, um, I suppose, was the workforce. They don't have spaces for 15 people. But, and they've taken a, a, a co-working space. And typically, everybody has found their own sort of network of third spaces. And some people use a local club about 100 yards away. Um, so I think it's, it's up to the individual. I'm, I'm not averse. In, in fact, it's probably a good idea for the company to have a bit of money available. So if, if there's a club membership that's required, yeah, why not? Um, I think that's helpful. But I think a, 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 a third space is, is a very personal matter. And you will probably keep your selection of third spaces even after you've left the company. They'll become favorites of yours. They could be clubs, they could be bars, they could be restaurants. They could, a, a friend of mine was made partner in a Washington DC law firm and the senior partner said, okay, you need, um, you need two places, Greg. Uh, you need a restaurant where they know you and you take clients that you want to impress or to celebrate a big deal or a success or whatever it is. Um, and then you need a park bench where you can sit and cry. Very personal. And I think third spaces are personal. And, and in many cases, they will outlive the particular job or the particular company that we happen to be attached to. The next question is uh, it's almost like an application of management theory at a large scale. It's does Chinese culture effectively reorder drucker, for example, self-organization, organization, or even society self-organization? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I think it, it puts more emphasis on Drucker's third, managing for the benefit of society, which frankly, in America, where Peter Drucker was working, he was Austrian, but he went to America, um, probably puts the least emphasis on. So I think, I think it does reorder it. Drucker's well read in China and um, people quote him. Um, and I think that they, I think if a Chinese person was asked that question, they would accept and support each of the three dimensions, if you like. You, you've, got, you've got to manage yourself before you can manage anybody else. If, if, you, if you can't manage yourself, it's all hopeless. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what, what, what political or ideological philosophy you're in, part of. You've got to manage yourself. You've got to manage for the company. And I found when I have a choice and I um, have thought, well, actually, what should I do? And I think manage for the company then it's very liberating. It, it, there's no compromise on that one, no compromise. And then li for the benefit of society. Um, so I, I think that's, I think the answers will be slightly different, but they will give um, emphasis to all three. And we have another, another question on how should we uh, start in terms of reimagining education, primary schools, secondary schools, further education or, or in universities, which I know you, you talk a bit about in, in, in the book, but do, do you have thoughts on yes. that? Yes. Well, I, I think education policy over the years, over the, let's say, I don't know, 50, 70 years, um, when um, university, the numbers of school leaders going to university went up from about 5% to about, to now it's 50%. And that's been a, a huge amount of money going to the universities. And that's um, part of the thinking of the way in which industrialized economies um, grow. Um, I think a, a, a flaw in that policy has been that schooling has been given low priority. 
And I think that's a real mistake. I think it's a pedagogic mistake. And I think it's a social mistake. We have undervalued schooling. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the primary, it's, 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 uh, it's primary, it's kindergarten primary, it's childcare, secondary, and a university. And we have to think of, think of the whole system. And I think our universities are, you know, they need, they need to change, but, but they, they are well resourced. I mean, there are one or two that are a bit weak, we know, and I, I, uh, I'm not surprised about that. There are many schools that are very weak in terms of resources. And that's, that's a terrible thing to say about a rich society. And I, I think we just need to put more, uh, give more attention, put more money into schooling. And that's what I would like to have happen. And then I think another, another particular um, uh, line of, of, of um, change, if you like, is, is moving out of the classroom uh, and, and rethinking the curriculum in terms of the subjects that we teach. And, and then also rethinking the way we, we recruit. Um, we, the way we recruit teachers and the way we recruit people who teach in universities and research in universities. And then finally, if I ask one other thing, which is that, that um, uh, a lot of funding in the British universities goes via research funding. Um, and that's important and it's useful to attract good faculty. But what is, I think, even more important to the students is good teaching. And we haven't quite worked out how to make that, if you like, the core of the undergraduate course. So I think that's, that's again, a major flaw in existing policy. We have one final question. And then as, as we're at the hour, we will draw things to a close. And it's what kinds of invisible work in particular going to the development of artificial intelligence tools and applications? Gosh, well, I do, um, I think, my chapter on AI is, is, trying to, is trying to get a handle on artificial work that humans do and artificial work that AI does and will do. Um, and I focus on two things. One of which I refer to is the AI's inability to explain. Um, whereas we humans, from our parents, from our... Ah, I'm sorry. For that. I thought I'd turned everything off. Um, uh, we are trained from childhood to explain and justify and articulate, and, and, and we're actually quite good at that. Um, AI isn't. And the other is that AI has a particular understanding of data and logic and how knowledge is generated that is different from human tradition. And that's, that's a huge challenge. I think that what I would love to see is, is some people at the top of government who understand data, statistics, statistical modeling, the nature of truth, the nature of logic, the crisis we're facing with COVID have shown that governments that do understand a bit of that do well, and governments that don't understand that, don't get it, uh, do really badly. And I think we have to find some way of getting our, our governments a little bit smarter when it comes to data, logic, truth, and how that works and how humans work and try and see how they can work together. So, uh, thank you, John, for, the, for such a wide ranging and uh, insightful discussion. Uh, I think we've covered loads of, loads of subjects in the questions.
and that that reflects how much ground you cover in, in the book on the range of different different topics that are I covered that, that that's much appreciated it's been a great conversation john thank you very much indeed i've loved it thank you lovely thank you very much we have uh another nesta in conversation event coming up on the 26th of may uh if you're, if you're interested uh where pragya agarwal is going to talk about uh unconscious bias so there will be a, another one coming on later in, in the month but uh okay. that's that, that that that's the end door of proceedings Thanks Good. very much for such an interesting conversation. John, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Am I still here? Uh, yes, yes, we're still here. Uh, 13 participants. <laughs>